Okay, so we are live on YouTube. I'll begin letting people into the webinar. We'll wait about five minutes so people can come in. Okay, since we have a good number, we will be starting with the housekeeping instructions. So, um, hello everyone, welcome to the webinar. And uh, I will just be taking you through a few instructions for everyone who has joined as an attendee to the webinar. So uh, they can um, have the best possible experience on this platform, Zoom. Uh, first thing I'd like to talk about is the audio settings. You can just click the audio settings tab here. You can click on the audio setting tab and this window pops up. You can test your microphone and speaker. You can test their levels and this uh, ensures that when you are called up to speak during the webinar, uh, the audio is working fine since we can't uh, do it manually for all the people on the webinar. We request you to use this feature so you can do it yourself. Next thing is the raise hand icon. If at any point of time you want to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, our uh, moderators, when they see fit, they will ask you to, uh, uh, they will unmute you and they will, uh, they will uh, request you to ask the question. And, uh, and once you are done, once you click on the raise hand icon, it turns green. You can click on it again so your hand is lowered. Uh, this will help us manage the crowd a little bit easier. After that, there is the Q&A box. Uh, you can at any point of time, even in the middle of the talk, you can uh, type in your question. Once you type your question in, you can uh, click send. And if you do not want anyone to know that you've sent, uh, that uh, you've uh, asked this question for some reason, uh, it's a controversial question or something, you can just select the send on anonymously box and you can click send and we will never know that you have asked that question. Um, Apart from that, it's uh, for everyone who's watching the live stream on YouTube, please uh, may ensure that, uh, that, you, that you type in your questions in the comment box in the YouTube, uh, uh, in the comment section on YouTube, we'll be monitoring it and all those questions will be relayed inside and we will try our best to answer all the questions that come in and definitely we will, we will be answering uh, a few from YouTube as well. So if you're watching on the live stream, just all the questions that you have, please just put them in the comments. The next thing that I'd like to say, the last bit is that there are no certificates whatsoever for this webinar. So uh, uh, please, uh, we request you not to email us asking for certificates because uh, we have no authority or capacity to give them for these webinars at the moment. So please take note of this. And with that, I will hand it over to Pavitra who will be introducing the Science Cafe and our speaker of the day. Over to you, Pavi. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome to another edition of our uh, Blisk Science Cafe. And uh, I'm so glad that you've joined us today. And our speaker is Dr. Ranabir Das. Before we get to uh, learning a little bit about his work, 
I'm just going to tell you about the Science Cafe. So the Science Cafe is a, a session which is an informal session for people from wherever they might be. Earlier we used to do this in the city at cafes and bookstores, but now it's for pretty much anyone in the world to join us and ask their questions to uh, whoever the speaker is. And uh, this is something that was uh, uh, is part of our outreach activities at the Bangalore Life Science Cluster, which I'm sure you're all aware of by now. And it uh, comprises of three institutes, uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences, which is where Dr. Ranabir is from, and uh, the Institute for Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine, and the Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms. So if you guys are not familiar with all three institutes, I'd recommend go check them out. And if you are, then thanks for joining us again. And uh, Dr. Ranabir is a researcher at NCBS who focuses on host pathogen interactions, which basically means he looks at infections and how they affect us. And uh, over to you, Dr. Ranabir. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, how are you guys? Hope all of you are in good spirits. Uh, this, I thank the uh, Bliss Communi Communications Office. This is a wonderful opportunity to speak to you and uh, share our excitement of working with uh, viruses. I'll try to share my screen now. Okay, so the topic of today's uh, discussion is sneaky and sophisticated viruses, how cells uh, turn into virus factories. Uh, virus is probably the most uh, relevant topic today, I guess, and uh, how they infect humans and human cells and how they replicate inside them and make multiple copies is the topic of today's discussion. So just a um, basic question of what do, how many bacteria or what is the microbiome of human body? That is like how many bacteria are present in the human body at any point of time? If one counts that, it's going to be 38 trillion. That many amount of bacteria are present in the human body. And so how many viruses are present in the human body? If we calculate how many viruses are present in the human body at any point of time, it is 380 trillion. That many number of viruses are present in the human body. It's a scary number, but it's nothing to be scared of because most of these viruses are plant viruses or animal viruses which are present in our body because of our consumption of food. And these are also flushed out of the body through the excretory system. So these viruses do not infect the human body. The number of viruses that have inf infected our human body are around 220 that were found to be infectious. The recent pandemic has brought about the question on whether these numbers are going to change. Are we going to have a higher number of viruses that are going to infect the human body now? This is questions is coming because if one tries to look at the viruses and the discovery, one would find that the viruses that are transferred from the animals to humans from 1990s have increased a lot in frequency and for example, around 2010, Zika virus was initially found in 1947, but it came back in 2010 once again, and Ebola has also come back. So the higher frequencies of these viruses, the way that they come and infect causing pandemics is a cause of concern for all of us. And the question that we are trying to understand is, is this going to be recurrent again? And how do we deal with that? And how much do we understand how these viruses operate inside the human body 
inside the human cells? How do they replicate? How do they make their own proteins? How do they replicate their DNA? How do they make their own copies inside the human cells? Uh, if you ask the question, what is a virus? There is a um, lengthy explanation present in the uh, books, which is a virus is an infectious, obligate intracellular parasite comprising of genetic material, DNA or RNA surrounded by a protein coat, sometimes a membrane. Now this uh, definition can be a little bit lengthy and uh, too much information, but essentially what it says that there's a DNA or an RNA and there's a coating of this DNA and the RNA. And that is essentially what is a virus. However, this virus, when this coated being is present, it can also enter any human cell and replicate inside there, which is a special property that is present in these viruses. So what does the virus do? A virus, when it enters the cell through the cell membrane, which is the coating of the cell, it enters inside the cell, there's uncoats itself and goes to the nucleus, which is a special compartment inside the cell. This is where all our DNA and RNA are replicated and the proteins are made, made in here. So the, uh, after entering the nucleus, the DNA is replicated multiple times. This DNA is also used to make viral proteins that make this capsid assembly and other proteins. And these capsids and these viruses package together, they exit from the nucleus and then slowly make out their way outside of the protein and uh, get outside of the cells to infect other cells in the other parts of the body. This happens multiple times and one virus can make several copies of itself like a Xerox machine, making multiple Xerox copies of itself. Essentially what the virus does is it turns this cell into a viral factory, which makes multiple copies of this virus. Now, depending on the genetic material that is present inside this coat of the virus, viruses have been um, sort of classified into different groups, DNA viruses, RNA viruses, or um, these are called reverse transcriptase viruses. But depending on the type of genetic material present, these viruses can be categorized. But what is important to note is that all viruses have to make their genetic material into something called as an mRNA or messenger RNA. From the messenger RNA, it is possible to make viral proteins, which the virus is going to need to make copies of itself, to make its capsid and all of that. So all of the required proteins are made by the virus through this intermediate called as a messenger RNA. And all of this genetic material is, trans is translated into messenger RNA from where the proteins are formed. If you look at the size of the genes of the virus, so we call as the genomic size, it is much less compared to the high eukaryotes or humans or vertebrates or animals. So if you look at this y-axis scale, you would see that it is almost 10 to the power five times bigger are the humans compared to the viruses. So it is one lakh times. So human genes are more than one lakh times than the virus genes. Now the proteins that the humans make and the viruses make are also scaled similarly almost. So it is going to be almost one lakh times more proteins in the human cell compared to what the virus will bring. However, when the virus replicates inside the cell, all of this system of the human cells are modulated. And this is what is shown in this figure is that when the virus enters into the cell and makes its copies, it not only is making these copies, it is regulating a variety of processes in the human cell. It is stopping multiple processes that will eliminate the virus it is stopping processes that are immune responses of the host cell. It is also stopping multiple, regulating multiple processes in the cell that will allow it to replicate and make its own copies. So a small virus with this small number of genes and small number of proteins, how is it possible for this virus to regulate so many processes inside the human cell 
is what is exciting to us. It is what is interesting to us and what is what I'm going to discuss with you today. So this is why we study viruses and many groups other than us also study viruses to understand how these viruses employ the host uh, cells and turns it into a factory to make multiple copies of itself. So for example, the various groups, research groups across the globe are interested in asking these questions about how does the virus enter? How does it evade the host antiviral response? So the host, the human body and other animals also have antiviral responses. I mean, they are you know, evolved to have multiple defense mechanisms that is going to eradicate the virus. But the virus has made a way to evade all of these responses, all of these processes. And how does it do that? How does it exploit the host machinery to replicate? How it, does it take help of all the proteins inside the human body or human cell, which, help, which will help it to replicate and make Xerox copies of itself? And finally, how does the virus exit out of the host cell? Our group's research interest is primarily focused on the second question, which is how does it evade all the host responses that have been trained to detect and then eradicate this virus or not allow it to replicate inside the host cell? How does it evade all of these processes? Why should we find that out? So it is very important to understand how our human cell works and at which cases does the human cell cannot deal with the situation? What is the susceptibility of our human cells? What is the susceptibility of our system? Where can things break down? And if you know that, that helps you to find out multiple ways in which you can also modulate the host system. For example, let's say I um, there's a case where there are tumors. These are your own cells that are not behaving correctly and you don't want them around, you want to kill those cells. Now, how do you do that? Because you don't know how susceptible your cells are. Is there a mechanism to do that? You know, the viruses have taught us a lot of way in which these host cells are susceptible and that they can be manipulated. And that information is also helpful to us in certain scenarios. Secondly, and the most direct uh, uh, sort of advantage of studying this is now we can interfere with the viral replication. Because if we know how the viral infection works, how does it target the viral host proteins? How does it manipulate them? Then there is a way that um, we can interfere with this process. For example, if we can find out all structures of how the host proteins interact with the viral proteins, how are these host virus interactions, then it is possible to design chemicals that can go and inhibit the process and thereby reduce the viral replication. So our model system in understanding the immune response and how the viruses evade the immune response is this virus known as the herpic simplex virus. It's a double-stranded DNA virus. I told you that several viruses have several different genetic materials. This virus has a double-stranded DNA inside it. Its genetic material is encoded in the double-stranded DNA. Around 70% of humans are infected in this virus. Probably all of us uh, or majority of us are infected with this virus. We may not be able to know because it's asymptomatic. Once infected, this virus stays with us for life. The host system is not able to eradicate the virus from the system. We do not have a vaccine for this virus currently, and there is no proper cure of this virus. There's no medicine that if you take, this virus is going to, this infection is going to resolve immediately. So this in the, in the, in the um, stream of virus science, the herpes simplex virus is known as the master manipulator of the host system and host immune response. So if you want to study how the viruses want to avoid the human response or how do they manipulate the system to avoid the human response, there's no better virus than to work with the herpes simplex virus or the herpes virus. Um, if you want to know what, uh, you know, really am I infected, but I don't see any symptoms, probably did I have any symptoms? One of the obvious symptoms of herpes simplex virus is the simple, you know, blisters that you have around your mouth sometimes, maybe you have had it ever, 
Um, these we commonly called as cold source. In the next slide, I'm going to show a movie which is going to talk about more about the herpes simplex virus, its symptoms, how does it infect, and how does it spread. And from there, we'll go ahead with the uh, discussion about what it does inside the cell. Sorry. Most of the time when herpes simplex virus or HSV infects a person, there are no symptoms. In fact, it also usually moves from one person to another in the absence of symptoms. So therefore it can move through a population silently. Once in a while though, it can cause symptoms. And typically those are in the form of skin and mucous membrane lesions, which can be divided into infections above the waist, mostly involving the mouth and the tongue, and those below the waist, involving the genitals. There are two types of herpes simplex viruses, HSV1 and HSV2, both of which are part of a larger family of enveloped double-stranded DNA viruses, the herpes viridae family. Generally speaking, HSV1 tends to cause infections above the waist, and HSV2 tends to cause infections below the waist but there's a lot of crossover because both viruses can cause both types of infections. Although herpes is most contagious when there are virus-filled lesions present, it can also spread by asymptomatic shedding, which means that herpes viruses can be in the saliva or genital secretions, even when there are no signs of a cold sore or genital lesion. Typically when herpes virus lands on a new host, in other words, a person who's never had herpes before, it dives into small cracks in the skin, or mucosa, and binds to epithelial cell receptors, which triggers those cells to internalize the virus. Once inside, the virus starts up the lytic cycle, which is where its DNA gets transcribed and translated by cellular enzymes, which help to form viral proteins, which are packaged into new herpes viruses, which can leave to go off and infect neighboring epithelial cells. HSV1 and HSV2 also infect nearby sensory neurons and travel up their axon to the neuron's cell body to start up the latent cycle. The sensory neurons of the face have their cell bodies in the trigeminal ganglia, and those around the genitalia are located in the sacral ganglia. So that's ultimately where the herpes virus settles in, for life. You see, those sensory neurons aren't destroyed. Instead, they become a permanent home for the herpes virus. And from time to time, the herpes virus makes a few viral copies of itself and sends those virus particles back down the axon so they can get released and infect epithelial cells. Since the trigeminal and sacral ganglia serve just one side of the face or body, herpes vesicles and ulcers develop on the ipsilateral or same side as the affected ganglia. This can happen over and over again throughout a person's lifetime, with classic triggers being things like stress, skin damage, and viral illnesses. Recurrent episodes are usually less severe than the primary infection, and sometimes there are no symptoms at all. When there are symptoms, there might be characteristic tingling or burning sensation called a prodrome one or two days before the blisters appear. Herpes can usually be diagnosed based on how the skin or mucous membrane lesions look, and can be confirmed with tests looking for viral DNA, like polymerase chain reaction, an antibody response to the virus, or by growing the virus with a viral culture. Although infections typically resolve without treatment within a couple of weeks, there are antiviral drugs like acyclovir, famcyclovir, and valacyclovir, that can be used topically or systemically to reduce pain and speed up healing. For recurring episodes, these treatments usually work best if taken when the prodrome starts, in other words, before the blisters develop, and high-dose intravenous antivirals might be given in more severe or life-threatening situations. All right, as a quick recap, most of the time, herpes simplex virus one and two cause asymptomatic latent infections that's set up in the trigeminal and sacral ganglia for life. But sometimes they can cause symptoms like recurrent oral and genital lesions. They can also cause more severe infections like HSV keratoconjunctivitis, meningitis, and encephalitis, 
as well as neonatal infections, which usually get transmitted when a baby passes through infected vaginal secretions. All right, so that was the um, details about how the virus uh, infects the human body and what are the symptoms and what happens after that. Um, now we are going to look a little bit into detail about what happens when virus enters the cell and how does it replicate there. So, uh, yep. Hi, uh, sorry, uh, maybe we can take a couple of questions if anyone has any about, you know, this introduction we got to the virus. Uh, is anyone there who would like to raise their hand and ask a quick question? Okay. I guess it was clear to everyone then. Okay. Uh, so, okay, we'll move on then. Okay, please continue. We can, of course, discuss this later as well. So, um, so I'm going for a next movie which shows how the virus enters the cell and what happens after it enters the cell. The herpes virion can bind to several alternative receptor molecules in the host cell membrane, after which the envelope fuses with the host membrane, releasing the capsid into the cytoplasm. The capsid travels down a scaffold of microtubules to the nuclear membrane. At the same time, a protein from the tegument, called virion host shutoff or VHS protein, degrades the host cell's mRNA molecules and thereby eliminates the competition for ribosomes and other cellular machinery. Another tegument protein called VP16 ultimately protects viral mRNAs. It also acts as a transcriptional activator of gene expression in the viral genome. At a nuclear pore, the herpes chromosome enters the nucleus. The DNA then circularizes to form a plasmid-like intermediate. VP16 works in concert with host factors to activate a set of viral genes called immediate early genes. These immediate early mRNAs leave the nucleus for the cytoplasm, where ribosomes translate them into proteins. In expressing these immediate early genes, the virus has entered a pathway called a lytic infection, in which a cascade of events culminates in the production of new virions. However, the virus could have entered a pathway called a latent infection, in which genes called latency or LAT genes are transcribed and keep the cell from committing suicide and from producing new virions. In a latent infection, the DNA circle can persist within the cell for decades before switching to a lytic infection. Latent infection most commonly occurs in nerve cells. In the lytic infection, the translated proteins of the immediate early genes return to the nucleus, where they turn on the expression of another set of genes called early genes. The mRNAs travel to the cytoplasm, where ribosomes translate them into proteins. These early proteins include a viral DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase and other proteins replicate the circular viral DNA. The production of new genomes for progeny viruses occurs by the rolling circle method, which generates a concatamer of many copies of the viral DNA. The newly synthesized DNA expresses late-stage mRNA, which exits the nucleus for translation. Some of the mRNAs encode capsid proteins and are translated on free ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Some of the late mRNAs encode envelope proteins, which are translated on ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum. Many late-stage proteins re-enter the nucleus to form capsids, and these capsids capture DNA genomes. A capsid buds through the internuclear membrane, becoming enveloped by a single membrane. The developing virion moves through the endoplasmic reticulum and buds off, after which it fuses with the Golgi apparatus. The virion eventually buds off the Golgi apparatus and fuses with the plasma membrane. The completed virion is now outside the cell. The primary infection occurs in epithelial cells, followed by latent infection within neurons of ganglia near the original site of infection. 
How a latent, rather than lytic, infection initiates in neurons is not well understood. The latent infection of the ganglia later leads to new outbreaks of virus, often triggered by stress, sunlight exposure, or depression of the immune system. Progeny virions travel back to the epithelia, causing lytic infection. All right, so this is the how the uh, virus enters into the host cell, replicates, what are the proteins that it expresses early, makes early, and then what are the proteins that it makes later stages, and how this whole thing is formed, and the uh, Xerox copy of the virus is made. Now, what is the host during all of the system? Is it just sitting idle and looking at it, uh, the virus do all of these interesting stuff? That is not correct. The host is at a constant war with the virus and has uh, elicits a lot of defensive responses uh, for the virus to er eradicate the virus. So one of the defense responses that uh, we studied recently is, is something that I'm going to share today. The, this defense response happens at this stage where the new DNA enters the nucleus and is replicating. So the DNA of the virus has entered the nucleus and it is now ready to replicate into multiple copies of itself. There are proteins called PML that can form cages inside the host cell. So shown in blue here mm -hmm. is the nucleus of a an, you know, human cell. And in red here as the PML bodies which come together to form cages like protein cages. Um, a sort of an intuitive version of this is this, where this PML protein is conjugated or tagged along with another protein called SUMO. And together, these two proteins can form these cages, which traps the HSV DNA or the herpes simplex virus DNA inside itself and does not allow the virus to replicate, to make its own protein and make Xerox copies of itself. So this is a fascinating mechanism that the human cell has developed to trap the viral DNA within itself and, does, and not, allow you to, uh, not allow you to replicate or make its proteins. Um, so what would be its effect? How do we find out? So it's easy. We do an experiment where we either have these PML proteins around or we do not have the PML proteins around. And then we check how does the viral uh, infection happen? That is the viral infection better in one case or worse in one case? So this is the data that I'm going to show you. This is an experiment called as a plaque assay where uh, it is basically measuring how the virus infection has progressed, how many plaques, which is the dead cells has the virus made in, uh, in y-axis is the time in a certain amount of time. So in shown in here where there is the square boxes is the case where the PML protein had been removed from the human cell. So there is no PML protein in the human cells. These cages are not present. In the second case, which is the triangle data is where the PML proteins are present. And also in circle is the case where the PML protein was removed, but the PML protein had been added later and uh, so the PML cages are present. In both the cases where the PML cages are present, you would see that the number of cells that are killed by the virus is low. However, when you remove the PML protein or these PML cages from the, uh, from the human cell, the number of infections grow rather rapidly, much more higher. So the PML cages sort of reduce the viral infection by trapping the viral DNA within itself. So this is the antiviral immune response from the host. Now, what does the virus do to escape this trap? What kind of, it cannot allow this uh, protein cages to be formed around itself. So it has to somehow escape this protein cage. It uses something known as the UPS system or the ubiquitin proteasome system. The ubiquitin proteasome system or the UPS system is a system which is used to take care of, uh, to trash damaged proteins and enzymes in the host cell. So the proteins and enzymes are the workhorses of in the cell. They do a lot of work inside the cell which maintains the cell. However, they are not, they can't work for eternity. At some point of the time, they get damaged. 
So how will this cell or how, how will our system deal with this damaged protein? It cannot allow this damaged proteins to be accumulated inside this cell because that will lead for the cell to die. So to take care of these damaged proteins, the host cell has developed something known as, known as the UPS, which trashes these damaged proteins and then allows the pro cell to stay normal. Now the virus intelligently uses this system to um, trash the protein cage or degrade the protein cage and then escape from it. Um, before we go into detail of how the virus uh, you know, does this, I have a small video about the ubiquitin proteasome system, which will allow us to help and understand better how this uh, system is used by the viruses. Many vital body functions serve to maintain a state of homeostasis or balance, for example, temperature regulation or maintenance of blood pressure. The same principle applies at the level of a single cell. Proteins, such as enzymes, are the workhorses inside all cells and they're fundamental for normal growth and renewal. Cells work hard to maintain a healthy balance of proteins. This important regulatory role is carried out mainly by the ubiquitin proteasm system, or UPS, and this is the subject of a drug discovery program by the Scottish Enterprise Ubiquitin Proteasm System Program. It's the responsibility of the UPS to seek and destroy damaged or faulty proteins or those simply surplus to requirements. The UPS maintains the right proteins in the right amounts at the right time. If the system fails, the result can be disease. The UPS can malfunction in two ways. It can become overzealous so that useful proteins are destroyed inappropriately. Or it can be restrained in some way and potentially harmful proteins may build up to toxic levels. An imbalance in the UPS system is thought to occur in common diseases like Alzheimer's, in viral and bacterial infections, in many cancers, and also inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. There are thousands of different proteins in any cell at any one time. So the UPS has a tough job to keep them under control. The UPS marks a target destined for destruction by using a ubiquitous small protein found in all cells aptly named ubiquitin. In essence, proteins tagged with ubiquitin are given a very visible death sentence. There's a lot of ubiquitin present in cells, but it can't attach itself to proteins at random. It is a highly regulated and controlled system to avoid any unwanted protein degradation. First, it must be primed for action by an E1 ubiquitin activating enzyme. This process also requires energy in the form of ATP or adenosine triphosphate. The activated ubiquitin is then transferred from the E1 onto a second enzyme called an E2 ubiquitin conjugating enzyme. This enzyme acts as an escort for ubiquitin to its next destination, the E3 ligase enzyme. The E3 enzyme acts as a platform on which the target protein substrate and the active something wrong with the video. Ubiquitin is then transferred in substrate and the active E2 ubiquitin complex can meet and interact. The E3 enzyme is extremely fussy about exactly which E2 enzyme and which protein can interact. The correct E2 enzyme loaded with activated ubiquitin can move and position itself correctly on the E3 ready for action. When both protein and ubiquitin are loaded onto the E3 enzyme, they're brought close enough together for the ubiquitin to be transferred to the target protein substrate, either directly from the E2 or through a short hop via the E3. This process can be repeated several times to create a polyubiquitin chain on the protein. The creation of this chain is the death knell for the protein. It provides a clear signal to the cell's waste disposal unit the proteasome to start work. The proteasome binds and removes the polyubiquitin chain and unfolds the protein. The protein is threaded through the proteasome chamber where it's chopped up into building blocks to be reused for the synthesis of new proteins. 
the ubiquitin can also be recycled. As we've seen, the UPS is a critical process in controlling cell function. When protein degradation gets out of balance, disease results. We believe that better understanding of how the system works could help us develop drugs to treat many devastating diseases. Currently, there is one drug on the market which takes advantage of the ubiquitin proteasm system. Velcade, which is approved for the treatment of a subset of cancers, inhibits the proteasm itself and leads to the destruction of cancer cells through a buildup of toxic proteins. However, this inhibiting action is relatively non-specific. Exactly how the UPS process works is the subject of intensive research. Looking at the E3 enzyme more closely, we can see that it's a complex structure which may have different mechanisms for identifying and capturing different target protein substrates. We know that in humans there are two types of E1 enzyme, approximately 60 types of E2, and between 6 and 800 types of E3. In other words, potentially nearly 90,000 different combinations. This uh, enzyme, which is the E3 enzyme, and is a donut-shaped enzyme, that is the interest of our uh, next discussion. What the HSP or the virus does is it codes for an E3 enzyme in its genome, in its DNA. And this E3 enzyme is called ICT0. It is one of the very early proteins that are transcribed by the, pro by the virus made. It is a E3 ligase. And now this E3 ligase is the one that tags the substrate with the ubiquitin chains. So this can target any antiviral protein that is not allowing the viral virus to replicate. So proteins like PML can be degraded very easily by the HSV by the uh, HSB using ICP0. So what does the ICP0 do? The ICP0 binds to this PML proteins in this PML cages called PML nuclear bodies. And then it also binds to the E2 enzymes and transfers this ubiquitin from the E2 to the, um, this PML cages and builds this ubiquitin chains onto these PML cages. Once this ubiquitin chains are formed, then these PML cages are degraded by the trash disposal system, which is the proteasome of the host cell. So essentially the virus uses a system of the host cell to degrade the antiviral response of the host itself. So it turns the system onto itself. Now the HSV genes are free. They can make viral proteins, they can replicate the viral DNA, and they can have a effective viral replication. Our lab was interested to study how does the ICP0 bind to these PML cages? Where does it bind and how does it bind? So proteins are generally made of a sequence of amino acids. And looking at the sequence of amino acid, we can make some intelligent guesses of what this protein is doing or which part of the protein is doing what. If we look at the sequence of amino acid in ICP0, we see that at the intermineral domain, there is an intermineral region, there is a, at the, in the beginning, there is a domain called ring domain, and we know that these regions bind to the E2 enzyme. So that part we know is where the E2 is going to bind. But in the rest of the um, sequence or rest of the ICP0, we could, looking at the amino acid sequence, we could make some intelligent guesses that there are seven possible regions where this protein PML uh, can bind. <clears throat> protein PML conjugated with SUMO will bind through the SUMO. So now where does the SUMO bind? To, to um, find that out, we had to do experiments. And the way that we do experiments is that we purify host proteins and we purify viral proteins, and then we mix them together and then look at their binding and then solve structures of them to find out where do they bind. So when Hemram in the lab did this experiment, he found out that among the seven regions, there's only one region that binds specifically to the SUMO protein that is contacted along with the PML protein. And the, the way that this ICP0 protein binds is shown in here in blue is the ICP0, in green is the protein SUMO which binds there. These are called structures of proteins. And here is a movie that shows how this um, 
protein, the ICP0 binds to the human protein, which is the sumo. The ICP0 is shown in here in orange, which makes like a strand that aligns itself to another strand of the, of the human protein sumo. And this is how it binds uh, to the human protein. So um, now we understood with it, then Hitendra in the lab showed that this is how the system works. This uh, ubiquitin ligase or the E3 ligase called ICP0 has a region that binds to the E2. It has a region that binds to the uh, sumo uh, PML. And then ubiquitin is transferred to this uh, PML protein. And this uh, multiple ubiquitins will now uh, lead to the degradation of this protein cases. Uh, as we in the lab also showed that uh, from the region that is a little bit away from the ring domain, there is another region that binds to a kinase, which is also a uh, human kinase called CHEC2. And that makes, uh, that makes some changes in the region where the, the sumo is supposed to bind, and which is known as phosphorylation in, in our science. And this essentially makes this binding much more stronger. So it's like, you know, you have two papers and you want to make staple them. So you put one staple, it's still kind of floppy. But now you put more staples in there. So you put three staples. And now these two papers are not as much sloppy. You cannot separate them. So what was we showed that is that when this uh, staples are made, then the, uh, the way that the ubiquitin chains are formed is much more rapid, much more quicker. And the ICP0 makes say, becomes a much more potent ubiquitin like this. Remember the ICP0 has to work fast. It cannot allow the virus DNA to be stuck inside this nuclear, this protein cage for a long period of time, because then the other immune responses from the human cell are going to kick in and they are going to eradicate the virus. So the, the ICP0 protein has to work fast and this is the way that it is much more efficient and works much faster to degrade these protein cages. So I just want to highlight that these structures that we have solved has shown how the viral protein binds to the human protein. So when we know how the viral protein binds to the human protein, we can now find exciting radius where we can inhibit this process, inhibit the interaction between the viral protein and the human protein and stop the virus from replication or having an effective infection. So um, this is, as I said, we use herpes the virus system to understand how viruses evade the immune response. And this is not the only virus that does this. There are many viruses which attack the PML cages because their genomes are getting trapped inside the PML cages. And uh, whatever we understand from the herpes simplex virus is also could be valid for the other viruses that also attack the PML cages. The other aspect is that um, these are the, some of the functions that we saw of ICP0, but ICP0 has many functions because it interacts with many other proteins in the human cells, which have been shown by other groups like DNA PK, IFTI6, HDAC, and USP7. So it interacts with a lot of proteins and regulates multiple things inside the human cells. And this is why these kind of viral proteins allow the virus to multitask inside the human cell. It allows it to regulate multiple processes in the human cell by interacting with multiple human proteins using distinct regions of its amino acid sequence. And uh, so what we, do we understand about the virus manipulate the host cell? How does it manipulate and turn it into factories? There are two most important things that we understood from the study of the ICP0 protein is that it want, the virus is designed to keep the most essential genes in the virus and then use the rest of the things from the host. For example, as I showed you in the ubiquitin proteasome system, there are multiple enzymes. There's E1 enzyme, E2 enzyme, E3 enzyme, and the proteasome. It does not code for, it does not have any of the other ones in, in its genome. It only has the E3 enzyme which will help it to identify the antiviral proteins and degrade them. The rest of the stuff, the E1, E2, ubiquitin, uh, proteasome, all of that, it takes from the host. So whatever it needs, it's essential for it, is going to keep it within itself. And the rest of it, it is going to use from the host. The second is it tries to produce 
viral proteins, which are good in multitasking. They have multiple functions. They interact with multiple proteins inside the host, and they can carry out multitasking inside the cell. So with the help of these, these two factors, it is possible for the virus to have a very small number of genes or viral proteins, but still be able to regulate a much bigger organism or organ, I mean cell, uh, entity like the cell and uh, the proteins inside them. I would like to thank the people who are, are the workhorses for our lab, which is the uh, Daspins lab, all these all my students. And uh, I hope uh, you like the tricks played by the virus. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Um, thanks, Ranavir. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, people who've raised their hands. And I think, you know, they want some clarifications on particular techniques that were used. Yeah. And I think your talk has given us all a lot of insights into very complicated processes that these viruses show when they are infecting a cell. So let's start with Aparna. Uh, go ahead, Aparna. Um, Aparna, you raised your hand. Do you have a question? Uh, please unmute yourself and, uh, okay, uh, maybe we'll move on to the next person. Um, Natasha, why don't you ask your question? If you raise your hand, please ask your question. Um, okay, I'm going to read out uh, Natasha's question. Um, she had asked about the plaque assay. She said, do you use PML knockouts or another uh, way to silence these proteins for PML negative condition? So, so what is the technique? PML knockouts. This is where the PML is uh, completely deleted from the cells. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, there are some more people who raised their hands. Uh, um, okay, uh, Lumina. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted to ask like earlier in the webinar, you said that stress is one of the factors that triggers the infection. Why is that? I mean, yeah, the mechanism of how the um, latent uh, virus uh, goes back into epithelial cells and becomes a lytic virus is not very well known. And I hope I could answer your question with more clarity. But what we've seen is that during stress, some of the um, stress genes inside our cells are upregulated or in the sense that they are expressed more, they're produced more. And some of the uh, virus senses that and activates itself. So um, there is a hypothesis that the, the way that the virus is staying latent is that it is making some modifications of its DNA, uh, which are known as like methylation and stuff like that. And these are, when they are, they are present, then the virus is silent and in a very quiescent mode and latent mode. However, some of these genes that are expressed during um, stress will go and then remove this late, the, these modifications on the genome. They will just erase them. So when these modifications from the human, uh, from the viral gene are removed, then they start become activated and then they will go to the activated phase and uh, start uh, spreading. Okay, wow, that's an amazing mechanism. And um, I had another question. So yes, you said that when the um, viruses enter the latent phase, they essentially destroy the neurons in a way. So um, can that lead to some form of neuro uh, neurodegenerative disorders? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So. The effects of the virus in the neurons uh, 
leads to some sort of a um, malfunction of the neurons, but uh, it does not completely destroy the neurons. So in when it goes to the neurons, it wants to stay with you. It wants to um, stay with the neuron uh, and replicate when the neurons are developing, it wants to develop, it wants to, you know, when the, the neurons are dividing, it wants to divide. So it wants to stay latent and quiescent and uh, such that no immune response detects it and just stays with the human system very quietly. It does not um, try to damage the neuron very much because if it tries to damage, then the other responses of the immune responses of the cell are going to kick in. It's going to detect the virus and it's going to eradicate it. But however, people have seen that, you know, in the neurons that are infected with the virus, the activity of the neuron is depleted to a certain extent. And uh, one of the ways is to look at it is to think about model systems like zebra fish or something like that, where you can infect these fishes and look at them to much more better kind of experiments with them, uh, with better recordings and better measurements to see what is the effect of this virus on the neurons when they are latent. Um, that has not been done currently. Okay. And so these viruses, they infect only particular nerves or can they spread to all other parts of the neural system? They are mostly detected in the neuronal ganglia. Okay. And uh, yeah, not, not everywhere. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Thanks, Ranabir. Uh, we'll go on to the next question, uh, which is uh, actually from YouTube. And someone wants to know, is ubiquitin uh, somehow responsible for any viral diseases? No, ubiquitin is not responsible for viral diseases. Ubiquitin is present to carry out a lot of functions in the um, cell. One of the functions that we talked about today is to take care of these damaged proteins. However, there are other functions like uh, our DNA is damaged and the repair mechanisms of DNA damage, the DNA repair mechanisms uh, heavily lie on ubiquitin. There are a lot of uh, the trafficking of proteins from one part of the cell to the other part of the cell. That also depends heavily on, in several pathways, it depends heavily on ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is present to help the cell to do all of these things. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the pathogens have found out a way to use it uh, for their own purpose. Uh, however, saying that we cannot remove ubiquitin from ourselves because it's going to be deadly. It is it's absolutely essential for our cells. And it does not help in the, um, it does not create any infection by itself. It's just used or exploited by the pathogens. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that clearly answers that question. Um, coming to another person who's raised their hand, Isha, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Isha Parikar. Uh, I want to ask a question that, uh, is there any sp specific uh, explanation why neurons are in latent infection? Uh, because you have mentioned this before, that uh, is there any property that for longer time they are in the latent infection and not going into lytic cycle? Um, so the virus chooses the neurons to stay in the latent phase and the epithelial cells, that's your skin cells, for mm -hmm. the lytic phase, um, where I'm in mean, the active phase. And <clears throat> no, I am not sure why the virus chooses the neurons particularly to um, stay in the latent phase. Um, that is not known. Sorry, okay. I, I, uh, because for for me it, it will be interesting to know that why, why what neuron has in special that this virus select this yeah. cells uh, what's so special about neurons something special should be there that that is feeling um, uh, the second question was uh, how the double membrane of virus is prepared is uh, not clear to me that can you please that explain that oh. again so the double membrane is uh, coming from the lipids that are present in the ER Golgi pathway. So from the endoplasmic reticulum, it collects some lipids and then goes to the Golgi where those lipids are matured. Okay. 
and from the Golgi, it goes to the periplasm, which is the outer part of the cell. And from there, it ejects. So those lipids are picked up from the in the ER and the Golgi. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, the last question is uh, have and uh, have this study on uh, these uh, virus you are working on have helped us understanding the COVID mechanism? Well, so you know this uh, the COVID is a RNA virus and this is a DNA virus. So the viruses are distinct and their mechanisms are slightly distinct. However, there are many many things that are um, common between them. And so definitely it helps us. For example, um, in the COVID uh, proteins that if you see what the coronavirus proteins they express, one of the uh, proteins that they express is also linked to the ubiquitin pathway. It's known as a de-ubiquitin enzymes. And that protein is absolutely essential for the virus to um, replicate itself. So yeah, there, these mechanisms are common. Certain mechanisms are definitely common between the herpes simplex virus and the COVID. Okay, thank you, sir. That's all. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, Isha. Um, we'll come back to uh, some of the questions that are being repeated in our Q&A box. A lot of people want to know, uh, you know, about the ways that you, if you do develop a therapeutic for this, um, how can the virus kind of evolve and what might be, you know, uh, the timeline for that? If you develop a therapeutic to so, yeah. target so, one particular viral ICP0. Yeah, so the, um, I'm going to respond to that based on the experience that has been seen in virus versus this therapeutic, again, war. Uh, what has been seen is that um, therapeutics generally occur uh, work um, even in the least case where it is um, not very effective, it has worked for 10 years at least. It is after 10 years that it is found that the repeated use of the therapeutics has somehow led the virus to mutate and escape the mechanism. And uh, which is why, but uh, which is why I feel that, you know, multiple labs should work on this mechanisms or viral mechanisms and find out more and more. So if, uh, if one part of the protein mutates or you know, mutates out and the therapeutic is not effective, then we should target something else. So, but that information we should have. For example, the SARS-CoV-2, the current pandemic is SARS-CoV-2, but the initial pandemic that of the same family was happened in 2003. And all the information that we are using currently is actually from SARS-CoV. So um, it is that all the 15 or 20, you know, 16 years of research has really helped us to tackle this issue, which is currently so urgent. So it is important for multiple labs to work on this viral mechanism, study the viruses. And also it is important for the um, government of the country to fund these kind of studies. Okay, uh, that's that's good to know about the timeline and how it's still, you know, very helpful that even if, you know, the virus mutates, you can still use that same information in further therapeutics. Right. And uh, someone wants to know about your statement where you mentioned that uh, lysogeny in the bacteriophage is determined by the survival value that it provides to the phage. And uh, do we see that in other viruses as well? I did not talk about bacteriophages today, and uh, so so what was this? I mean, I didn't make this. Sorry, it was. Uh, it, sorry, the question was: uh, What is meant by the statement that um, bacteriophage is determined by the survival value? Um, I guess that's totally different from viral dynamics, right? Yeah, I mean, bacteriophages are viruses; they infect the bacteria, and. Uh, I, I did not make this statement, so I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Sorry, it was a misreading of the statement. It was just about that statement. Okay, uh, coming back to some of the other questions. Um, so how is the immune system being suppressed here? Um, the U uh, UPA, uh, UPS, sorry. And is there any other um, sort of ways that it's being suppressed? Yeah, so there are um, different... Uh, 
pathway is called interferon gamma pathways, which are activated when the cell detects a uh, foreign material like this virus DNA. So, um, and then there are different capping enzymes that are also activated by the host uh, cell, the human cell, when it detects the viral DNA, which will come and cap this DNA and not allow it to make proteins. Um, all this, so in both, it is found that ICP0 regulates both of these processes again. It also destroys those DNA capping enzymes and does not allow them to cap the uh, virus uh, DNA. It also destroys the critical proteins that will activate the interferon gamma response. And so that interferon gamma response is the inflammatory response, is the characteristic inflammatory response of the human cell that will further lead to degradation of the virus or eradication of the virus. But the critical proteins that activate those interferon gamma response are also uh, degraded by the ICP0. So in a in the in using the EPS, the independent protein system. So it it you know takes care of multiple of the immune responses of the host cell um, and then degrades them and don't allow the normal immune response of the host protein, I mean host cell to be activated. Okay. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, we'll take one uh, live question. Uh, Pooja, go ahead. Hello. Hello, Pooja. Yes, sir. The while manipulating host cell, do virus uh, destroy the defense mechanism of host or how it oh, go on? I'm a bit confused about that. So your question is, why does the virus manipulate the host response? Uh, actually, I want to know that while manipulating host cell, do virus destroy the different defense mechanism or it develops some other mechanism to attack host cell? No, in this case that we discussed today, the virus destroys the defense mechanism. So the defense mechanism are these protein cages formed by the PML protein. And the virus uses its own protein to tag these uh, PML cages and destroy them. Um, so uh, the specific case that we discussed here is, is a case where the virus uses its own protein to destroy the immune response. Now, um, there are other mechanisms used by the virus depending on this scenario. One of them could be just uh, uh, laying very low copy numbers, which is the latent uh, infection cycle, in which case it just uh, is so low in number that the immune response does not detect it as a foreign body at all. So that is a different kind of evasion mechanism that is used by the virus. Um, the, the topic that we discussed today is where the virus uh, destroys the response from the uh, host cell. Um, thanks, Pooja. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we'll come to a question that a lot of people have about um, the resting phase, you know, the latent phase. How is it still um, active uh, in suppressing the host human uh, immune response? So in that case, the uh, in the latent cell, uh, in the latent case, it is actually, um, as I mentioned for Pooja's question, it is not actually actively destroying the immune response. It is kind of staying so low in numbers inside the cell that it evades the immune response. The immune response is not able to properly detect it and, um, and eradicate it. So, um, that is the way that it maintains itself in the latent cycle. And it will uh, express a couple of viral proteins, make some viral proteins, which will, you know, sort of inhibit the inflammatory responses and uh, sort of keep the immune response much tied down and not allow it to be detected. And this is how it persists inside the human bodies for ages. Till, um, that's why it's known as once the herpes simplex virus infects you, 
it stays there. It just uh, stays low, stays undetected, and uh, cannot be eradicated from the human cells. Okay, I, I think that was some good. Uh, people had a lot of confusion about what exactly it was during that latent phase, but I think you've cleared it up. Um, so someone wants to know about um, you know if what if you were to mutate the binding site uh, binding attraction site uh, would that be possibly the method of uh, you know avoiding that degradation so i mean in in our lab we have definitely verified that that if we mutate those binding interaction binding sites then it cannot bind and it cannot make this ubiquitin chains onto the PML proteins. And so the PML is not degraded. However, inside the cells, if you want to do that, you would have to do something like a CRISPR-Cas mechanism where you want to mutate the PML protein where this uh, viral protein would bind. And yeah, if you want, if you can do that, if you can do that genetic therapy to mutate PML proteins in the human cells, that is a strategy that one can have to deal with the virus, definitely. Okay, great. Um, we have a lot more questions and um, I, I think we won't be able to answer all of them. So maybe we can request that people write to you if they have specific questions about your research. Definitely. Okay, and uh, some of the people are uh, concerned about, you know, the virus and things like that and how it is trans not transmitted, but how you can improve your immunity and things which are more medical questions, I guess. Um, okay. Is there anything you would like to add about your research? So from these questions, especially? Well, I mean, what we have currently understood is that the immunity is, is, is very important because in the, in the, even in the herpes simplex virus case and also in the case of the SARS virus, uh, coronavirus, we have seen that the immunocompromised people have recurrent viral infections. So for example, in the case of babies, neonatal babies who have just been formed and just born, when they have the virus, it is recurrent and it can be severe and actually uh, can give, can cause death. Also in the people um, who are mature, uh, old and they have their uh, immune responses compromised. The virus infection is recurrent and comes back um, frequently. So um, all of this points to the uh, information or the notion that the immune system of the host cell or the human is absolutely important. In any case where the immune system is compromised, um, the infection takes toll, a heavy toll on the body and comes back frequently. So um, just uh, have a very healthy lifestyle, eat good food, sleep a lot, sleep helps immune responses immensely, and uh, have uh, regular exercise, keep your immune system very, very strong. And if you do that, then the whole system will deal with the virus by itself. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to have any medicines. What we um, are showing is also something similar is that if you, um, healthy immune system by even a little bit, as, I, as our study shows that there are constant interactions and fight war between the virus and the immune system. And if you can do your part in keeping a very healthy immune system, that will definitely help you to win the war. So um, that's the message, keep your immune system strong. Uh, thank you so much, Ranavir. I think uh, this has been really fascinating and I think it's piqued everyone's interest about how these viruses are infecting people and perhaps the herpes simplex virus wasn't so familiar to all of us and I would definitely recommend that everyone go and read up about it and, um, you know, and also thank you so much for sharing all of this information with us. Thank you. It was, a, it was a very good experience to talk about our excitement to all of you. And uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, the more we talk about these things, the more it is going to help us. Great. I'm putting in uh, Dr. Ranabi's email ID in the um, 
chat box so you all can please contact him with your many good questions and uh, we'll end the session now so okay. thank you all and please stay tuned for more events thank you again rana yeah, thank you i'm closing the call uh, please remember to share the live stream of the talk with all your friends goodbye